Last week, we looked at the beginning of this book, the opening of the prophet where he describes the end of the world as we know it. And tonight we get to see two appropriate responses to that initial introduction to the day of the Lord. Follow along as I read from Zephaniah chapter one, verse seven. Be silent before the Lord Yahweh for the day of Yahweh is near for Yahweh has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Then it will come about on the day of Yahweh's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. And I will punish on that day all who leap on the temple threshold, who fill the house of their Lord with violence and deceit. On that day, declares Yahweh, there will be the sound of a cry from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good or evil. Moreover, their wealth will become plunder and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses, but not inhabit them and plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. In tonight's passage, we encounter two responses merited by the destruction of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, the destruction of the day of the Lord merits two responses. The outline for tonight is incredibly simple and also elegant. These two responses are silence and sorrow. Silence and sorrow. Each of these responses, silence and sorrow, beneath these responses, you have the reasons given and then the event described. And that is the parallel structure that Zephaniah the prophet gives us as he articulates what is to come. The first response that this day merits is silence. He gives reasons for this silence and then describes the events that merit such silence. Beginning in verse seven, just notice the command, be silent, be silent. The destruction that is coming on this awful, horrendous day of the Lord warrants this kind of initial response. Silence, nothing to say. The, the idea here is that the events that are taking place, the effects of this day are so horrible, so tremendous that they inspire awe and leave the, the person seeing this description, uh, in particular, those who are experiencing this horror, they leave them speechless with nothing to say. He gives two reasons why this, this silence is warranted. First, because it's nearness. The nearness of the day of the Lord warrants this kind of speechlessness and awe. Verse seven, for the day of Yahweh is near. It is close. This word uh, just indicates a timing a nearness of time. So it's not far off. It's close. It's at hand enough, close enough to be called near. And so the people hearing this prophetic message would have had no indication as to a particular time. They wouldn't have been left with the thought that, okay, we have so long to get ourselves right before that day comes and get right with God. They would have just known it's incredibly close. 
You don't know how long you have left. A day, a year, several years, a couple millennia. From God's perspective, articulated through Zephaniah, this day is what he calls close. His day is near. And then another reason is given for this silence. Because Yahweh has prepared a sacrifice in the middle of verse 7. For Yahweh has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. And so here, the, the next reason that's given for this silence is because of what God has done or what he rather is doing with this day on this day. He is making ready a sacrifice, making ready a sacrifice. This is the purpose of of the day. And he's even called out people or summoned some for this day. That is what the term guests means. He has consecrated or set them apart. And he has set apart people who he has summoned or called out for this particular day, this particular sacrifice that he has prepared. You get the imagery here that This day is close. God has a guest list and he has set the itinerary for the occasion. And so that naturally leads us from the reasons given for this silence to the event described in verse eight. Then it will come about. It will happen or it will occur on the day of Yahweh's sacrifice. And then he unfolds the, the description of this event. Here, here we're first introduced in verses 7 and following to the particular word day, the Hebrew word yom, the day of Yahweh. And then it's repeated in quick su- succession. You'll see in verse 7, the word day appears. It appears again in verses 8 and 9 and 10. And then another reference to at that time. In verse 12, and then several more times in the sections that follow. So all that he's been describing, this universal destruction is a part of the day of the Lord. And here he describes it as, or one of the purposes as a sacrifice. And this is in particular, according to verse eight, a slaughter. That's what's in view with the word, with the term sacrifice. Then it will come about on the day of Yahweh's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, the king's son, etc. One of the, the reasons for this sacrifice is for individuals to be slaughtered in this punishment or this avenging. One commentator says those who have long despised the sacrifice that God provides become the sacrifice their sins merit. Those who are on God's guest list for whom he has laid out the itinerary for the occasion, they are guests coming to this sacrifice as those who would be slaughtered. And in particular, this is a punishment. Look there in verse eight. I will punish the the term there has to do with avenging, visiting for the purpose of avenging wrongdoing. And then he names these people against whom his vengeance comes. They are princes or chief ones. They are the king's sons, those associated with the royal line in some way. Those who are similar in a similar category as Zephaniah himself. If you remember from verse one, he is of this royal lineage, not with rights to the throne. But he is a descendant of royal blood. And so he would have been well familiar with the lawlessness uh, being committed among those associated with the royal line. 
And so he prophesies that this slaughter coming on against those whom God is going to avenge himself. Some of them are the princes, the king's sons. And he adds those who clothe themselves with foreign garments. This category of those who clothe themselves with foreign garments would have certainly included people of such affluence as the princes, the king's sons who could afford clothing from afar. But the category actually is broader than just those individuals who possess affluence because he's not opposing mere wealth. But within Israel, there were in the Mosaic law guidelines for what kinds of clothing you could and could not wear. Leviticus 19 records that Israel was not to wear garments with mixed fabrics. And so getting your clothing from afar, from uh, people who were not under Mosaic law, would have been forbidden because they would have uh, certainly not, usually not, adhere to Mosaic requirements. And so these are people who uh, are sinning under God's system, opposing his law, and he just identifies them by even the clothing that they can afford, that they, that they wear, that they choose. These are the people against whom God's vengeance comes. He has another category, a fourth category in verse 10, or excuse me, verse 9. Notice his avenging, his punishment is also against those who leap on the temple threshold. Those who leap on the temple threshold and then another category who also fill the house of their Lord. This would have been God's house with violence and deceit. With violence and deceit. Let me show you what's going on here in first Samuel. Flip back to first Samuel chapter five. There's a practice that began in Canaan among the Philistines of stepping over the temple threshold. This did not originate in Israel. This was of the Philistines. And when you realize in chapter five of first Samuel, why they began doing this, then you'll notice the sinfulness, all the more of the practice that Zephaniah is indicting. First Samuel chapter five, verse one. Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. This is at a low point in Israel. In Israel's history up to this point, they lost this battle. And the glory had departed from Israel when the ark was taken. Verse two, then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. This is their own deity, their idol. So here's the ark of God where God's very presence is meant to dwell. Israel was not to even look at this ark or else they would die because God's presence was so associated, so dwelling in this ark that it was fatal to even mishandle this ark. You'll perhaps remember the instance of Uzzah when he reached out to catch the ark falling off the ox cart and he, God struck him dead for touching it. This is that ark. Verse three, when the Ashdodites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. You think about this, this idol falling over in the middle of the night. No one's in the temple. It's closed for business. And they wake up the next morning and it's on the floor on its face in a worship posture before the ark of God. If you have to set your own God back up, maybe he's not worthy of your worship. Verse four, but when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh. And this is the next day. The head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. 
Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who enter Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. So here, the Philistines' God is proven impotent and worthless, helpless before the God of Israel. Once they're put in close proximity, And because this idol is defiled and marred, he's cut off his head and then essentially his arms, and and only a, a, a minimum of this idol is left. And where the palms or his hands were cut off and fell were over or on the threshold of the temple. And so the practice began, instead of just forsaking the idol, these pagans just amend, they just add to their worship practices by further consecrating the idol and not stepping on the place where his hands landed. How foolish. Well, apparently, according to Zephaniah, this practice had been taken up in Israel. How stupid are God's people when this, to pr- take up this practice that originated by idolaters when their idol was humbled by Israel's God? Who thought, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do what they do when our God defeated theirs and they further consecrated their worthless idol. Now let's just not step where they step, where they refuse to step, where their God was defiled. This was a practice that was apparently so common in Israel. It had been taken up in the temple and those same people in the temple who would leap. That's a, not just a stepping over, but it's more emphatic, uh, a word that sort of trivializes the practice. They leap over it. This joyful, uh, flippant, almost practice. But then they leap over the threshold to go do what? Fill the house of the Lord, their Lord, with violence and deceit. This is really the same practice that Jesus had to address when he came. The violence, the deception, the doing uh, the idea is doing violence to the very law of God in the temple, you know, bringing what they gained from widows property and taking advantage of orphans, oppressing people they should have been caring for. They go and worship God with that. This is wicked. And so God says his day is coming for those people who would practice such things, foolish forms of idolatry, even in devotion to the God they profess. One more description of this event is its comprehensive, uh, the comprehensive nature of this event. We've kind of seen this already uh, where in verse two, God talks about this complete obliteration of things on earth. Uh, He talks about the worldwide nature of this destruction and then hones in on Jerusalem in particular, on Judah. And then we get another glimpse of the comprehensive nature of what's coming specifically in Jerusalem, because in verse 10, look at the places that he identifies on that day. Again, on that day, declares Yahweh, there will be the sound of a cry from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Three different places named. The fish gate gained its name from the market that um, was held at this particular gate on the north side of the city of Jerusalem as fishermen brought in the catch of the day from nearby lakes. The, The gate or place of second prominence is identified as well in verse 10. And then at the end, 
places, not just at this prominent fish gate and the secondary place, but the hills which would be surrounding Jerusalem. So three different places of prominence, uh, familiarity within Judah, all mentioned to demonstrate that this gate, this day comes. And in each of those places, there is this silence or uh, lamentation happening in each of those places. There will be a sound, the sound of a cry. Literally, this is uh, screaming, yelling, happening at the most prominent, profitable place of the city. Also, there's wailing happening at the second, secondary place from the second quarter. And then a loud crash or collapsing from the hills. The, the sound there probably coming from the people, possibly from just the, the surroundings, from the, the earth itself, the destruction happening on this day. So you possibly have people and places being destroyed. And just notice these things merit crying, screaming, wailing, lamentation, and collapsing. These are the sounds that are going to be able to be heard on that day. These are sounds of distress and death on the day of the Lord. And so again, the first response that this calls for is silence to just marvel at these things. We would do well to do that, to take up this response, to consider the nearness of the day of the Lord, to consider the purpose for which it comes and just pause and stand in awe that this day is coming. Think about of all the things that you consider doctrinally, theologically, to strengthen, encourage your own heart, to strengthen your convictions, to motivate you to live an upright life. How often do you consider the day of the Lord? This future time coming upon the earth when the destruction for Jerusalem and the rest of the world is so great and so comprehensive that wherever you go, you will hear this kind of lamentation, this kind of destruction. This is for our instruction. This is for the Christian. The second response is warranted as well. First silence, but then sorrow. You see that these are not two separate, distinct, really responses. They're just two different aspects of really the same uh, event, the same response, this silence, this wailing. Because we just read in verse 10 from the second quarter comes what? Wailing. And so here there's a command to wail, to lament, be sorrowful. This is appropriate. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar. This would have been a specific uh, district of Jerusalem. You may even have that footnote in your Bible. Again, God is honing in on the city of Jerusalem and he gives reasons just like he did in verses seven to 10 for silence. Here he gives reasons for the sorrow for all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will, will be cut off. This reference to the people of Canaan and those who weigh out silver is probably uh, a, a reference to the same group of people, the Canaanites being those who the people of Israel would have been doing business with at this time. Uh, and they were just known for their industry. And so they're just simply called Canaanites or the people of Canaan and those who weigh out silver. But it says that they will be silenced and cut off. So here you have sort of a mixing again, of the ideas silence 
call for wailing, here wailing calls for silence. They're intertwined. The people of Canaan will be silenced and those who weigh out silver will be cut off. What's being described here is comprehensive ruin, economic collapse, and unprofitable labor. All of those things will be true of the day of the Lord. They will characterize the day of the Lord when it comes. Comprehensive ruin, economic collapse, and unprofitable later, uh, labor. Here again, God's focused on this region of the world. Inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's the, the mortar that's referenced, and then the surrounding people uh, in Canaan or those who weigh out silver. They'll be silenced and cut off. At this time, there won't be any more weighing out of silver. The labors of those who devoted themselves to industry, as often as hard work yields profit, it will be no more. Those who weigh out silver won't be able to be found in this day. Just flip over to Proverbs chapter 11. Verse four. I think this is another passage just as we start to think more, hopefully about the day of the Lord. We can see other places in scripture where this awful day has been anticipated. Proverbs eleven four says this. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath. But righteousness delivers from death. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. We'll see that message echoed soon by Zephaniah in chapter two. But this is the idea here is that on this day, when the economy collapses, when labor is no longer profitable and those who would have been profited, uh, profited by their industry no longer can be, then riches do nothing for you. They're vain. They don't benefit you at all on this day. Um, of course, we all remember what happened in, in 2020 as uh, reports about the coronavirus started to come in. And for a disease that certainly had some impact, but on the grand scheme of things was not very fatal. The pandemonium that ensued and the lack of things like toilet paper. Just imagine when there's a real concern, real destruction, a real pandemic and pandemonium when worldwide lamentation will be the appropriate response from everyone dwelling on the earth. What will that be like? Recently, when, when Emily and I went to uh, Hawaii, we, we talked about that as we drove around the big island. What's it going to be like when God starts to upend the world, fish in the sea, according to Zephaniah verse 3, will be ruined, they'll be obliterated, birds of the sky, man and beast, you probably don't want to be living on an island at that time where everything has to pretty much be imported and there's a lack of resources, there's a lack of people, tremendous numbers of people are dying all the time. People probably aren't going to be worried about delivering your Amazon packages. There will be genuine economic collapse at this time. Besides the reasons given for this sorrow, we get further. The event described just as before he described the event for silence. Now he's going to describe the event again as he calls for sorrow. And he begins in verse 12, this description with, at that time, it will come about, it will be at that time that these things will occur. That 
phrase at that time is indicating a moment or period marked by characteristic and suitable events. Uh, this is just a, a description of a, of a coming season or period. Not a particular date is in view, but just a, a period of human history when the following things will be occurring. What will happen? Well, there will be a diligent search. This, this description of the event is a diligent search that's taken up by God himself. It will come about at that time that I, this is personal for God, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will, here's our word again, punish or avenge the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good or evil. What's this search about? This search really is describing a thorough inquiry by God where there is no gloomy, deep, dark corner of the world where God will not search out the sinners for whom this wrath is intended. There will be nowhere to run. There will be nowhere to hide. There will be not a single safe place in the world for sinners to go away from the wrath of God. Turn over to the book of Revelation. We can see this very clearly. Chapter 6. We've been reading through this in our main services on Sunday morning. Hopefully some of this sounds familiar. When these three series of judgments, three separate series of sevens come upon the, on the world. This is the beginning of them. When the seals are broken, you have seals, trumpets, bowls, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. This is just in the seals, this first round of seven. And already when the sixth seal is broken, look at what people are saying. Look at verse 12. I looked, the apostle John says, I looked when he broke the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair and the whole moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split us apart like a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Some of those categories sound familiar. Chiefs or prominent people, kings, Sons, kings mentioned here. What do they say? Everybody from the small to the great says, verse 16, to the mountains, they say, to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? This is this day in view finally arrived and no one can stand. There is not a single person who can endure. There is not a single amount of resources that can escape, that can afford to be rescued. There's not a single safe place on earth. And it's better, they think, to be crushed by the moving mountains than to have to continue to endure that day. And this is just the beginning of things. How awful is that day? Back in Zephaniah 1, God will thoroughly search Jerusalem in this way for the express purpose of avenging himself against, he calls them men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good 
or evil. These are men who are apathetic and act like atheists. They're apathetic and practical atheists. That term stagnant in spirit uh, has to do with, it's, it's a language that has to do with uh, refining wine. Apparently you, you let wine sit so that it can age, but it, what you don't want to keep as a part of that wine to drink has to be removed. And if not, then it causes all of the wine that's been sitting to congeal and kind of get hard. <laughs> These men are like that in their spirit, hardened, unfeeling, unuseful even, and bitter like this wine would have been. And here's what they're saying in their hearts. Yahweh will not do good or evil. He's inactive. We've seen this attitude already back in verse six. Those who have turned back from following Yahweh and those who have not sought Yahweh or inquired of him. You remember the, the two terms there were apostates and atheists. There's apostasy and atheism in view. The apostates are those who have turned back from following Yahweh. The atheists are those who act like God doesn't exist. They don't seek him. They don't inquire of him. Here again, these people act like God does not exist. They live a life separate from God, not concerned about God as if he does not matter at all. He won't do good or evil. It's of no consequence whether you worship him. He won't punish and he won't reward. Well, this, this wrath, this vengeance from God is coming for them. Furthermore, this, this event being described as a diligent search, a definitive avenging, and finally, a disappointing day. Verse 13 describes the disappointment of this day. Their wealth will become plunder and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses, but not inhabit them and plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. How disappointing. Wealth will be unprofitable. Homes will be uninhabited and vineyards will be unenjoyed. All of these things are for naught. To build houses where well, you won't live in them. To gain wealth where well, you won't be able to spend it. And to cultivate vineyards but not enjoy the fruit of them. All of these things will come true on this day of the Lord. How disappointing. This day calls for silence and sorrow. I just want to draw out two applications for us, a New Testament audience, hearing these words of doom and gloom. All scripture is profitable, right? For instruction, for our spiritual benefit, for our complete equipping. Two points of application of a passage like this. One for your own sanctification. Let this passage serve your own sanctification. How can this passage serve the sanctification of the believer? This passage can, can accomplish sanctification in us as we meditate on the doom that is coming by ensuring that you are not headed for this day, that when this day comes, you don't have to endure it. We already read this in Proverbs 11, righteousness delivers from death. Whereas riches won't profit on the day of wrath, that won't benefit you. What will benefit you? Righteousness, genuine righteousness that proves you believe God, that you have been rescued from this day. Do you possess that kind of righteousness? Just think about your life. Does your life so conform 
to the requirements of God, do you so bring your will under his authority that you can confidently say that day is not for me? When you notice the categories of sinners for whom this day is coming, those categories, those descriptions of sinners for whom this day is coming just don't characterize you. I'm not someone who turns back from following the Lord. Sure, I'm not perfect yet. I may stumble and falter, but I'm not someone who has left following the Lord. The righteous falls seven times and and he gets up, right? Does that describe you? Are you someone who seeks Yahweh and inquires of him? So that in moments of trial and temptation, you result back, you retreat back to God as a refuge by drawing near to his word. Do you desire to long, do you desire to know God's opinion? Do you search out the scriptures to know what he thinks about all things so that you can bring your life into submission to his will? If you do that, if you strive for that, then you can be assured that this day is not for you because this day is clearly coming for those who fit that description. Those who are stagnant in spirit, idolaters, as we've seen. Those who deserve the avenging retribution of the Lord. Those who are convinced He won't do good or evil. Do you live like someone who believes God will do good or evil? He will bring about ill or reward. Do you live that way? Then this day is not for you if you if you do. Flip back to another encouraging New Testament passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul saturated his own mind as well as the Thessalonians thoughts with reminders of the day of the Lord. And this becomes an impetus, an occasion for Paul to say comfort one another with these words twice in this context. Just before chapter 5, so if you move back one verse to 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Paul says, therefore comfort one another with these words. That's because he's just finished describing the rescue that the church will experience from the day of the Lord, the rapture. This catching up of God's people in the air with Christ. This day is not for you. There's a rescue coming. Therefore, he says in chapter 4, verse 18, comfort one another with these words. And then if you move just over to verse 11 in chapter 5, he's not done giving the same exhortation. Therefore, comfort, same word, translated encourage in the New American Standard Bible, but it's the same word as comfort. So comfort, comfort one another and build one another up just as you also are doing. Why is this an occasion for building each other up? Look at what he says in chapter five, verse one. Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night while they, that is the sinners that aren't you that aren't following Christ, that aren't you who are going to be rescued from that day. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. You're well aware of the day. You're anticipating it. You're meditating on it. You know that it's coming. You're preparing for it by living upright lives from faith before the Lord. Verse five, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. 
So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet, as a helmet, the hope of salvation. The believer, by bringing his life into conformity, To God's will, by living uprightly, sets himself in contrast for those who will be cut off or cut off guard by the day of the Lord when it comes. Those who will be cut off guard by the destruction of the day of the Lord who will be surprised by it, they don't live this way. They get drunk. They do their sleeping, as Paul says. At night, they are people of night, people of darkness. You're not like that. And so God is destined you not for the day of the Lord when it comes, but for something else. What is that something else? Look at verse nine. God has not destined us for wrath. That is the day of the Lord's wrath when it comes. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for what? For obtaining salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. By living uprightly in the here and now, the Christian proves to his own soul and the rest of the watching world that he is destined not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation from the coming wrath. And that is salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who died for this very purpose to rescue his people from the coming day of the Lord wrath. That is whether you are awake or asleep. That is whether you die in Christ or you're still alive when Jesus comes to rescue the church from the coming day of the Lord. So meditating on the coming day of the Lord strengthens you to say, I need to live righteously. I need to live a godly life to demonstrate I am, that day is not for me. And as you gain ground in your sanctification, you comfort your own soul that you indeed have been saved by God because only God can produce godliness in his people. The second just natural application implication from this text is not only for our sanctification, but for our compassion toward unbelievers to think about the day that warrants silence and awestruck breathlessness in light of what's coming and great lamentation, this sorrow To not warn people of the coming day, what do you make of that? Think about similar events that have occurred in, in, I guess, most of our lifetime. Maybe not some of you younger folks in the room. If if you knew that 9-11 was going to occur before it happened, and you knew someone who was going to be on the flight or in the Twin Towers on September 11th, what would you have told them? You, what, would you, what length would you have gone to to prevent them from getting on those flights or from entering the, that, those buildings on that day? You would have done absolutely everything in your power. And if you knew someone who didn't, you would call that cruelty. You would call that evil to not go out of your way to try and prevent their destruction on that day that called for silence and sorrow. This is a much greater day, a much greater destruction than 9-11 ever could have been. So what, what should be our response towards sinners whom we encounter as we go about our day-to-day lives who we know do not know Christ and are doomed for this day that's coming. 
Call them to repentance. We ought to have compassion on our neighbors, on our coworkers, on our children, on our friends, on our family members who can at times be the hardest people to preach the gospel to. To overcome our fear of man for the sake of preventing them from seeing this day is an act of incredible compassion. And we should strive for that. This is an awful day that's coming. And if we believe these words, then we will bring our lives into alignment with these truths. Just like everyone in Zephaniah's day, including Zephaniah himself, he's convinced of the word that he has received from the Lord. And so he is declaring this, this day, all of the truths that we still read. He told everybody about this and it's proof that we're still reading them now. We should be the same. Warn sinners of the wrath that that is coming and urge them to flee. People should get a sense when we communicate this way with them that they, at least we believe sincerely that they are in mortal danger. Their soul is at stake. Do you plead with people from, to flee from the wrath of God to come? We should. We must. We must make this a part of our Christian life. As certainly as you are pursuing personal holiness, we must also urge men and women to flee from the wrath to come. Let me pray. God, you have just given us all the, the details, sufficient details to produce an urgency in us, urgency to live a certain way, urgency to communicate, speak a certain way. We ought to speak as people who are destined for another world, a kingdom that's coming. We should communicate as people who have, by your grace alone, escaped the wrath that is coming and extend that same grace to others. Help us to be these kinds of people at Grace Bible Church so that people, when they encounter another person in the coffee shops who is from Grace Bible Church, out and about in our daily lives where we do business and wherever we go, people from Grace Bible Church, what is ringing in their ears is repent, flee from the wrath to come so that they would say about us, that is a people who believes what they read in the Bible. Only you can produce that in us. Only you can produce this sense of gravity and sobriety uh, from your truth. And so God, use your word to have its way with us, to affect us truly in this way so that we might live like a people who truly does believe you. And you are trustworthy in everything that you have said. Thank you for this incredible prophecy. I pray that it would have its work among us in only ways that you can accomplish. And we ask all these things because of who Jesus is and on his reputation alone. Amen.